Hello, and welcome to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. I'm Isla Garcia, Master's Degree of Nutrition Science and Registered Dietitian, and I'm going to make weight loss realistic, sustainable, and uncomplicated for your busy lifestyle. On this podcast, me and my team of registered dietitians will decipher the latest nutrition research, dissect fad diets, and discuss social media trends for you so you can feel confident knowing what to eat to achieve your health goals. Research suggests that most weight loss programs aren't successful, but my experience has taught me that this is not because the participants aren't committed. It's because those diets are designed by non-nutrition professionals and center around severe restrictions. We are here to provide the facts about the science of weight loss so you can have the success you want and continue living your best life. Hey, it's Isla, and this month on our membership platform called Millennial Living, we're focusing on building healthy habits. Knowing how to build healthy habits is really the basis of making any health changes or having any weight loss. So we're going to bring on some guests this month that can teach us about sustainable behavior change and which healthy habits are really worth working on. To start this month, we're going to bring on therapist and Dr. Maddie Elberger, founder of her private practice, Downtown Behavioral Wellness, to talk about Sam Smith's weight journey, break down the psychology behind habit building, how to identify which habits you should change, and some tips on what to do when changing those habits are difficult. What stuck with me the most from this episode was when Maddie explained that changing behavior is difficult, but we need to accept it and just start small. Let's listen to exactly what that looks like. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Maddie Elber. That's right, right? Yes, that is me. I am thrilled to be here. This is very fun for me. Yeah, you've just been on all the podcasts recently. It seems like you've just like come out or have you like done them and you just love them and so you're trying to get on the little circuit. Honestly, I started listening to Eileen Kelly's podcast and for the last many, many years, my patients and friends have been like trolling me to make a professional Instagram. And so I made a professional Instagram because I kind of have like fairly strong opinions about how mental health is portrayed and like treatment is portrayed on the internet. And I I didn't have a problem with it. So I was like, all right, whatever. Fuck it. Like I'm going to do my own thing. Um, I'll do it. Fine. Um, And then I heard Ariel Laurie on, who's amazing. She's a friend of mine now. She's fabulous uh, on Eileen's podcast. And I was like, okay, I'm going to reach out to her. And I reached out to the, the foster sisters because someone's like, oh, Aaron's in DBT. You should absolutely like reach out to them. And they were both really interested. And then Eileen's team reached out to me. Um, so, and then a bunch of other folks have reached out to me and I'm happy to come on if it feels relevant to you and your listeners. I love spreading the gospel. So Awesome. We love it. We're such big supporters of, I try to get all my clients in some sort of therapy because I find that they're definitely more successful so I can just focus on the nutrition end. So we're always looking for more people to kind of bring on. But today we really kind of want to focus on habit building. So we're going to get into that. Um, But just some questions about you first. So what made you want to become a therapist and like pursue so much education because you're so educated? I love school. (laughs) Okay. Like literally I'm obsessed. I'm obsessed with school. Um, I just like absolutely used to say for years, which is like, so whatever that like, I, my talent is school. So I like, just, I like really enjoy tests and like kind of the competition of all of it. And I actually entered um, undergraduate thinking that I was going to be an attorney. And for some reason, I thought that being an attorney means you had to take econ. So I, (laughs) I, I like registered for an econ class and I like walked in and I was like, this is awful. Like there's no fucking way I'm doing this. And I had taken the AP in high school and I got a five. So I was able to like place into a, you know, a higher level than a 100 level class of psychology. And I was like, oh, I'm really good at this. Like, this is like, just speaks to me. So it was like, I like fell into it, except for that. I think I was, I'm like, I've always been like well suited to specifically the type of treatment that I provide. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. And then the doctorate part, I don't feel like it's super common. I don't know, at least like where I live to find therapists that have doctorates. Why, um, even just like at a personal interest, why, why'd you pursue that part? So I started out as a clinical social worker. So it was masters. I actually have a dual masters in clinical social work and early childhood and special and general education development. Um, because I was like, I don't really care about research. I'm going to do that. I want to do therapy, but I want to do, like, I want to do it right away. I don't, I don't want to do research. And then 
I got a dual master's just four years instead of a doctorate, which is five. And I was like, well, why don't I do that? And then I was like, I actually do love research. I'm really, really into research. I'm actually presenting at a conference soon. So I'm like very much so in into academia. I love academia as much as I love clinical work and I love teaching. And so I was like, all right, like I'm going to go do this. So here we are. <laughs> there you go. There you go. All right. Um, what makes you or your practice different from others? Because we have a lot of therapists on. Like, what do you feel like is unique to you? Or, yeah. Okay. Well, have you ever had a DBT therapist on before? I don't think so. The last therapist we had on started, I think, talking about because that's the acceptance part of things, right? Or no, that's different. DBT is acceptance and change. Was your therapist that you had on an ACT therapist, acceptance and commitment therapy? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Well, DBT therapists are really different. Like I am not that unique as a DBT therapist. Mm -hmm. Um, I from really, really incredible mentors and I have amazing colleagues who are like some of my best friends who I still like liaise with clinically and personally, but DBT as a treatment protocol is quite different. And when I say treatment protocol, I mean just like the way we interact and vibe and like the way we do things. And I would say like within individual therapy and DBT, probably the largest difference that folks see or that like I think, and this is why I think I'm so well suited to this is it's like very direct, very straightforward and very genuine. And like, you know, I use sarcasm with my patients when it's appropriate, but like my patients know about my life. I know my patient's life. I've been to their like significant events, like if they've invited me and, Aww. you know, like, so, and like my patients know like a ton about me. They know like if I went on a bad date or a good date, because I'll use these examples. Like I'll, you know, we use a ton of self-disclosure in DBT because well, for several reasons, but we're modeling like you, like, you know, living the treatment, which we really do believe in, but also like the folks that tend to be well-suited for DBT in terms of symptom presentation are generally more emotionally sensitive people who pick up on like ingenuity more. And so in DBT, we really believe like in order for somebody to make really significant change, um, you kind of have to have an authentic relationship. I mean, my patients, I'm available to my patients 24 hours a day, seven days a week for crises, but like, I also get memes, you know? So like, I think that's the biggest difference. I think that a lot of schools of thought and, and like different therapy training programs will say, you know, not that much self-disclosure and keep boundaries and, and DBT is mindfully has mindful limits and they are flexible, not rigid. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. That sounds so different. At least like, cause we're semi-taught as like kind of counselors for nutrition change. And it's always like, don't talk about yourself and, you know, don't be friends and stuff like that. Um, it sounds so different than what I'm used to, but that's so refreshing. Does it, does the type of person that work with you, like what would their, do they need that? Or is it like a type of disorder that works better with that? Or how would you know that you need that type of therapist? Um, so a deep DBT dialectical behavior therapy was originally created by Marshall and Han, um, in 1993 for the treatment of borderline personality disorder. Mm. Um, I highly recommend listening to Eileen Kelly's podcast. She does a solo episode about her diagnosis about borderline personality disorder. And then I get do an episode, an episode on DBT and treatment of borderline mm. personality disorder, but very briefly, Borderline personality disorder is a psychiatric disorder similar to like anxiety or depression or whatever, it's just another name. Um, and it is marked by like six very big emotions, extreme emotion dysregulation, impulsive behaviors, suicidality, things like that, difficulty with like severe difficulty with interpersonal uh, relationships, et cetera. That's how DBT started. And it's a treatment that has skills, training, individual therapy, et cetera, et cetera. So if you're a person who has a history of like very, very strong emotions, any sort of impulsive or dangerous behaviors, mm -hmm. um, you know, interpersonal the ups and downs that like just you can't seem to get like managed, you're probably appropriate for DBT. That being said, DBT over the last 20, 30 years, I guess. Wow. Okay. <laughs> 1993 was 30 years ago. Um, so <laughs> over the last 30 years has been like extensively researched and utilized for like many other clinical populations that maybe aren't as acute as some people think of it for borderline personality disorder. So it's really effective in OCD. It's effective. There's a whole protocol for people with PTSD. There's, it's really effective in treating eating disorders, particularly binge eating, but also anorexia. You have radically open DBT. It's really effective in treating substance use disorders, mood dysregulation. So 
if you are going to see somebody who's a DBT therapist, like I want to make sure they're properly trained, but like it might be that you're not in adherent DBT, but anybody who identifies as an, a DBT person like me, like even my non DBT patients are getting DBT because it's just like the stylistic manner in which we work with people um, that like kind of permeates everything. That's a very long answer. I apologize. No, that's good. That's good. Cause I feel like a lot of people just think all therapists are the same. That's, we have an audience question at the end and we kind of already answered it. Then uh, where somebody asks, like, how do you find a therapist that, you know, suits you or matches you? And I think that kind of speaks to that. So I'm glad that you went into it. Sure. Um, one question we always ask everybody to in the beginning is, are there any new foods or like wellness habits or anything that you're getting into that people can like be inspired by, or even just like have an idea, anything? Yes. So, okay. <laughs> Uh, okay. Number one, I am training for my first half marathon. If you follow me on Instagram, you know that I'm annoying and can't stop talking about it. Cause like, I feel like that's like a personality trait and like now it's my personality Okay. and like, I don't run. I just was like, I want to do something that I've never done before. So it's very hard, but now I'm like extremely, my therapist actually, who's amazing. Um, it's a big runner and she's like, Oh, you just need to always be drinking electrolytes. Like always. And I'm like, Oh, okay. So now I drink Element, LMNT, mm-hmm. so sponsored, <laughs> but feel free to sponsor me. I drink their electrolytes because they are like the cleanest and they have the highest sodium content, which is really helpful. Mm-hmm. Shout out to my best friend, Ashley, who told me about those. And I also have recently kind of moved away from eating a lot of processed stuff, mm-hmm. like meaning like low fat or like whatever. And I... I'm really just trying to eat like regular foods. It's much better for my digestive system. I have some um, like autoimmune inflammatory stuff um, like arthritis and et cetera. And so it's actually been much more helpful. And that's also an Ashley thing. And I am also now mostly gluten-free because of my arthritis, which is honestly fun. Yeah. I feel like this day and age is pretty easy to be gluten-free. It's like, I feel like there's a lot of good options. So it's not as bad as it used to be. Literally. Yeah. And it's also like, it's, I'm not, I don't have an allergy. It's just like better for my system. And so like, if I'm really in the mood for a piece of pizza, like I'm going to make, I can make the choice to have it. I can have regular soy sauce if I want to. I just may or may not, not like have like, you know, puffiness and stiffness for several days after, but like that's a choice, you know? Well, cool. Cool. We love electrolytes. I'm glad that you're getting the sodium in because a lot of people forget that that's like an important piece. You can't just have all the sugary good ones. So this month, we're talking all about the health habits you should and shouldn't be adding to your spring health regimen and adding more produce should for sure be a health habit that you add in. I know that one difficult part about adding in produce is constantly being busy. So I have a solution for you. It is Bada Bean, Bada Boom, Crunchy Broad Bean Snacks. They are roasted broad beans and come in flavors including sweet onion and garlic, mesquite barbecue, and zesty ranch. These are for sure the millennial nutritionist approved because they're only 100 calories while containing six grams of protein and four grams of fiber because they're a bean. Plus they're actual produce and not like a powder or some some sort of manufactured fruit product. It's really just a bean that's been roasted, flavored, and put in a snack bag. My favorite thing about them is that they're a produce item that you don't have to keep cold. So they're really portable. You could put them in your car, you could put them in your pocketbook for those times when you either forget to have produce or you're out and about and you don't know where to get it. Um, One real life example is my mom came to visit me recently and we did some sightseeing around the big city of Dallas. So I knew we would need some produce items throughout the day or it probably just wouldn't get eaten. So I packed some of these bean snacks Both she and my mom thought that they were so good. David really liked the sriracha flavor the best, and my mom really liked the sea salt flavor, just to highlight how many really cool flavors they have. And my mom actually ordered them in that moment to be shipped to her house in North Carolina, just as a testament of how tasty they are. I actually found them, the Bada Bean Bada Boom bean snacks on my own when I was at Aldi in that special section. So they aren't there anymore, but I bought them and was so surprised about how good the flavors were. My favorite flavor is the sweet onion and mustard. They remind me of those like honey mustard, honey mustard pretzels that you would get as a kid at like friends parties and stuff and then like just never have them regularly. I show them on a grocery haul and Bada Bean Bada Boom reached out to me to give y'all a discount code. So you can order them online now at www.badabeansnacks.com slash the millennial nutritionist and make sure to use the code the millennial nutritionist and make sure to spell it right. We'll put it in the um, show notes um, and put in the millennial nutritionist code at checkout to receive 15% off. 
make sure you order them online because I really can't find them in any other stores now that they're gone out from Aldi. Um, but order them and stop letting busyness be the excuse as to why you're not eating enough produce. Um, we also always cover a little pop article. So I couldn't find anything like that was like super standing out like that's like all over TikTok or anything. But I have recently fallen back in love with Sam Smith. And I didn't realize that they had this like whole like identity transformation with everything. Um, and then I, as a dietitian, was interested in their weight journey because um, I know that they kind of left the scene, came back at this smaller size. Seems like they left again and then came back with like a whole new persona or just a whole new identity. And it's great. They look, seem really happy. And so in this article, we'll link in the description or the show notes from Mirror. They talk about their weight journey as far as being at a higher weight at a younger age, losing the weight, then maybe engaging in some activities that weren't super healthy for them. So gain the weight back and now trying to find peace their body and what that means for them now. So I was just like wondering about your two cents about that whole journey in general and what that kind of you feel like means from a psychological standpoint of like losing weight that might not go with um, fixing the things that are going on in your mind and kind of how that plays out. But any initial thoughts in general just about like the whole article or story? Well, I'd have to read it no. <laughs> to give a better, more effective response. Um, uh -huh. My most toxic trait is that like, I am terrible preparing for things. So like, you're fine. You're fine. Uh, for what it's worth. Um, I would just say like, you know, I think particularly with gender identity, there is a, a, from what I understand, and I'm not an expert, like a correlation between like body shape and size. Mm -hmm. And I do think that, again, there is a mindful way to engage with your body, gender identity or not. Um, like not all weight loss is bad. <laughs> not, you know what I mean? Not and and so if that's part of someone's journey, I think like the what you want to understand really is like what um like what's the function of this? That's the question I always ask. Like, what is this do? Why are we doing this? Mm -hmm. I don't love to ask why questions. I think why is often like a uh, like a black hole. It's mm -hmm. more like what what's happening for you? What are your thoughts around this? Like what what do we think is driving this? Like what mm -hmm. let's get to the bottom of this. Are we losing weight because we think that like your our worth is tied into weight and it will fix our problems? Because um that's probably not gonna be it. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, if somebody d is feeling like they would let they like they the shape of their body could change, there is a way to do that mindfully. And I think again, like particularly with gender stuff, there's a whole other like ball game that has to do with gender identity, gender fluidity, body shape, et cetera. Um, so it's in, in a very dialectical fashion, like it is not one way or the other. I can't, I can't say one way is right and one way is wrong. I think it's all about mindfulness, understanding the function of something, and then being very forthcoming about the process in which, and like the ways in which your body shape and your weight and your eating habits are impacting your emotional health and vice versa, how your emotional health is interacting with and transacting with the way you eat, the way you see yourself, the way you dress, et cetera. I hear you saying that it really needs to be looked at like comprehensively as far as like the overall picture. I always tell my clients, we want kind of like a better overall quality of life. We don't want to just lose weight to be the lower body weight and then think that's going to bring us happiness. And so I kind of hear you saying too, to kind of look at everything and where that's going to bring you. Is that what you're saying? Essentially. Yeah. I mean, like, I think in general, like it's really unwise to be reductivist in any way. And so like this one, if you're coming at something saying, if I just do this, or if I just get this, then then X, Y, Z, A, B, C will be different. You're probably putting too many eggs in one basket and not necessarily like understanding all of the different pieces of the puzzle or willing to accept them. So yeah. it's like, it's always like, there's always a piece. Yeah. Um, another question I had from that is and like in general, how can people figure out like what balance of health goals versus like what is going to improve their overall quality of life looks like for them? And I'm kind of thinking that sometimes I get clients that take their health goals from like online or what this influencer they like follow and then they try to like do it for themselves and they find they're not really happy. So like how can somebody even find what health goals they should be working on for themselves? It comes back down to this question of well, what's the function of it? You know, mm -hmm. like if you want to understand food better, um, that's great. Mm -hmm. 
I'll refer you to a new nutritionist and you work with a nutritionist, right? Like I am not a nutritionist. I do not talk to people about, about what to eat unless they're not, unless there's like faulty beliefs around eating certain foods or whatever. And then even still, if it's anything that really has to do with like nutrition stuff, I'm always referring out. One of my best friends, Amanda Karp is an incredible nutritionist. I refer to her all the time um, and other folks. So, and right. I, I think again, it, it's like, why do you want to change your weight? Mm-hmm. What is going on there? And can we make this a part of the puzzle? And what does that really mean? Does that like, you know, are you looking for a quick fix? Like, what's that about? Mm-hmm. It's, it's really, it's complicated. Like, I think it's complicated, but like I said, I, I won't tell people what to eat unless it's like, you have a food aversion and it's not accurate. We need to do exposure to that. Or like, you need to eat three meals a day because you're not eating enough. Like, and that's actually not helping you. But, um, I think it depends. And I work very, like, I really enjoy working with other professionals. Like, I, cause I don't know, and I don't want to tell someone the wrong thing. And I want to educate myself as well. Yeah. But it sounds like from a psychology point of standpoint, you're kind of saying that, um, again, it just goes back to figuring out what it means to you and what are you hoping is going to be on the other side of that and really getting to that, not just like being at a lower weight just because, is that right? Yeah. And I'm sure that's like, sounds similar to what you had mentioned before, like the way in which you like talk to clients and assess them and all of that is like, what's, you know, but what's this doing for you? Exactly. Well, moving on to like how we get there, behavior change 101 is kind of one that I want to nail down with you today because it's definitely, I mean, I feel like it's probably both of us. It's probably a little bit nutrition. It's probably a little bit psychology. So we can work together to figure out what this is for our listeners. But first, let's start broadly. And why is sustained behavior change, aka habits, I'll be using those interchangeably if that's correct, important to overall health? Consistency is like that is how you create behavior is through consistency. Mm -hmm. And we're all just essentially like we're mammals, right? So we learn like mammals. Um, So the way you train a dog is the way you train yourself. And if you know, you, we don't expect a puppy to know how to sit. If we're only saying to them once a day, sit, Mm -hmm. right? Like that's not going to work or we're doing it like intensively for three days, but then we just don't practice the training with them for a week, you know? And so it's the same idea. Like, in order for something to be automatic and like for us to like be able to tolerate the discomfort that comes with changing something or doing something unknown, we need to do it over and over again so that we unlearn any sort of like fear response to the new thing. And also so that we don't have to think so much about it. Like, so we operate so frequently, like the less, the less thinking, the better. That's what I have to say, the better, like all all the time. Like if we're talking about crisis management, like I tell folks to have a distress tolerance list, you know, just if you have to think less, that's great. So like, if you want to work on your sleep, like wake up at the same time every day, Mm -hmm. just do it. It will become your circadian rhythm will habituate to that. It won't become a thing you have to think about anymore. But if you want to wake up at seven every day and you only wake up at seven, you only try to to set your routine to do that once or twice a week, you're not, it's not, not going to happen. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. So as far as like how that relates to like overall health, like why somebody would even want to change behaviors, it sounds like you're saying it does like cut down in that like mental distress of like constantly having to think about it. Is that what you're saying? Or is there another piece of why somebody should even work on it? The reason that behavior change is hard is because, or creating a new habit is hard is because we tend to give up on something too fast. And Mm -hmm. like, So in general, human beings have just a low frustration tolerance for not getting what you want immediately, particularly when it comes to things that we believe are at least somewhat in our control. There's so much value to building habits. It teaches us that we actually can tolerate change. We can tolerate discomfort. Mm -hmm. We do have much more self-efficacy than we believe, right? So if I can create a routine where I'm cooking for myself every night, which I, by the way, wish I could do, and I'm just not willing to put the time in. But like, if I can do that, then then maybe I can like switch, you know, get a promotion at work mm. or like be assertive with my friends, you know? So it, it like, I think one of the greatest values in learning a new behavior is that that like that feeling of self-efficacy or the capacity to like the the knowledge and the belief that you have the capacity to make change in your life, internal locus of control permeates out to like everything. It like osmosis into our body. And like, we learn that we can do other things. I also just think like, again, routines hold us accountable. Mm. They help us. And I really do think they help us think less. If you know what you're doing every day, 
they're less likely to get overwhelmed and do something impulsive. True. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense. I am working with therapists too, and I haven't for a really long time. And now I'm like, okay, it's it's time to just figure these things out. And one thing, you know, I'm like, I just don't want my life to be stressful. Like it's, I don't, I'm tired of it. And she's like, it's probably is going to be stressful, but like, you now you know, you can work through it because you've done it in the past. And I'm like, Ugh, exactly. yes, but I feel like that's kind of what you're saying. Yes. And I was going to say, don't fall into that trap. Don't go to therapy with me. My <laughs> philosophy is making these generalizations and I'm like, I'm leaving an internet footprint. <laughs> but like, generally speaking, I say to people, and I, I've, I've said this on podcasts before, like, do not come to therapy with me to be happier. Come to therapy to be able to deal with your shit better mm-hmm. because that's actually going to make you feel over more, overall more content. And men to me being, feeling happiness, which is like this level of like, I is, is really just, I can handle my, th- my stuff. <laughs> I mean, it makes me frustrated because I'm like, um, I came here to fix things and now I can't fix them. And now I just have to sit in it, but it does feel better. It does feel better. Um, what about, I mean, I get a lot of clients who think that as a dietitian, I'm just going to solve all their problems. And I'm always telling them like, we have d- different disciplines for a reason. So how does behavior change relate to psychology? Like if somebody's struggling, like with health changes, like why would they benefit from going to a therapist or a psychologist or you? So a specific example would be, I feel like I um, get this the most when I start having clients exercise. And we start really simply, let's just start with walking. Um, And the hardest part seems like the doing it, like the starting, it's like the going. And so I feel like there's only so much I can do and so much I feel like comes down to starting that habit. And it's always like we eventually get to this mental block. We realize of like, oh, well, I never think I can do it. And I'm not the therapist part. So how could something like that be addressed in therapy? So again, I'm a cognitive behaviorist. I'm an evidence-based provider. I really strongly believe that thinking isn't doing. Insight is valuable and it only gets us so far. If we don't know what to do instead, we can't change. And so being able to like understand the beliefs that are driving, you know, like the, what is this, where's the evidence that you have that you can't do stuff? Like, have you tried? Like Mm -hmm. what's actually getting in the way and then being able to, because any good cognitive behavior or any effective, well-trained cognitive behavioral or dialectical behavior therapist is going to say, well, prove it. You don't have any evidence to that, you know, Mm -hmm. or like you do, like, what if we did something a little bit differently? And so you create plans with people to be able to try to implement change. And when it's not, when it doesn't work or when it's not effective, or then you troubleshoot them and you help someone understand ultimately, like what was getting in the way, what emotions and thoughts were getting in the way, what can we do? What other skills can we implement to get those out of the way? If you really want something, don't like, if you don't, then just, then we're just not going to do it. We're going to take it off the table, right? Like I'll, I'll say, all right, we'll take it off the table. And then people are like, no, but I don't want to take it off the table. I'm like, well, then you have to be willing to do something differently. Mm. You know, like it's just the bottom line. Like, no, you're not going to, you know, lose 30 pounds in one day. Like doesn't sound healthy, but if it were like, cool, it's just not the way things are. You have to certain, like change comes with acceptance to your point before. Mm-hmm. Like you have to accept certain realities in order to actually access the capacity to make effective change. And then what does that look like in therapy? Unless that's like a super long answer, just because I have a lot of people that are really so scared to go. I'm always trying to convince them to go. So like convince somebody how they can make change through therapy is basically how I'm asking. Okay. That's a big answer. (laughs) (laughs) There's so many different ways to make change. First of all, I'm speaking from a very particular perspective that I feel very passionately about. Yeah. Um, And at the same time, like my way is not the only way, right? So Mm -hmm. I think first and foremost, if you are thinking about treatment, just start researching, like just think, just take a step, right? That's always, and that's the thing that we, like that mirrors what happens in session in terms of behavior change, which is like, just take one step. Like what's one thing we can do to get you closer to this? Mm -hmm. And we have a skill in dialectical behavior therapy called um, building mastery. And it's essentially how to set effective, realistic, reachable goals that are challenging because there's that zone of proximal development where we need a certain amount of challenge to learn and to engage. And at the same time, not impossible so that we're not setting ourselves up for failure, getting frustrated and stopping. And so part of part of building mastery, part of changing behavior is figuring out how to break down a goal into really small steps. I always say to patients, like, I know this seems dumb that we're, we're like really, really breaking this down. I'd rather us just have all these pieces down just so that we know that we might need to go from here to here to here to here, as opposed to like, you feel like we didn't cover something and then you are taking it back again. The more, you know, 
the less you have to think, um, the better off you are. And so it's really like, okay, what are the actionable steps we can take? What do you need to do to take step one? Let's like just start with step one. And so again, like just being realistic and building up that capacity to feel like you can do something that's unknown. Gotcha. Uh Okay. And that's what I would say about finding a therapist and find somebody that you like and you vibe with. It's super important. Like it, it, it would be mindful of letting go of trying not to be over-engaged in what you think a therapist should or shouldn't sound like, look like, do, and just really kind of see whether or not the conversation with this person makes sense to you. And and it feels like this person's like on your team. Like if somebody's trying to work on behavior change and therapy, therapists really help with breaking down all those barriers, pushing against like those reasons of why you don't think you can do it and just finding a way to make it easy in the beginning. So it's more successful as opposed to like getting way ahead of yourself and starting with the hard thing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, particularly in cognitive behavioral therapy, that's like in any behaviorally based with CBT or DBT, that's what we're going to be doing. Other treatment modalities might do things differently. Again, like psychodynamic therapy or psychoanalytical therapy focuses more on past experiences. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't know how they have behavior change. That's part of the reason that I'm a cognitive behavior therapist, because I really relate to the idea of like, here's what we can do right now. Um, how do we know which habits are worth making versus not worth making? Because I feel like this is a like even like a negative step of sometimes I have clients that are like, well, I'm really trying to, you know, just not eat anything past seven. And it's like, well, why are we even spending time on that habit? Because it's not evidence-based. So like, how do we even start there? Well, I think you just answered the question. Like, where are you getting that from? You know, I think the qu- the idea of worth is a very subjective term, right? And so again, and I'm speaking from DBT. So DBT we have we speak very mindfully about the idea of judgments and a judgment is not what we think of like calling something disgusting or like being rude it's just a general overall label that doesn't provide enough description or information to like actually help us understand what's going on so the word worth like if somebody said to me how do i know what's worth it i i would be like well how do you define worth like how are you what does worth mean you know what does worth mean in terms of this goal that you have and that's how you define it. There's, it's also like the idea that I like to say to people, like nothing's like, you know, nothing's set in stone. Like you're not writing something in blood when you're going to try something, you can try something and say, I want to try it for X amount of time. And then if it's not working for me, like, then you can do something different. Like that's a huge piece of problem solving is like being able to pivot. And so it's like, what's worth, what's not worth? Like, what do you want? How do you imagine getting there differently? Like, and what's the worst thing that could happen? And how do we plan for that and make sure we can fix that? Because then there's really no risk. So are you saying that it really just, again, comes down to like the, like you as an individual? It's not like you would find some plan on the internet and be like, these are the 10 best things to do, so I'm going to do them. But it comes down to like what works for you and what makes you feel better. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. I mean, with the exception of like dangerous behaviors, right? Oh, like, yeah. you know, if somebody's like severely eating disorder, like that's mm-hmm. not a choice. You know, it's mm-hmm. like, yeah, you could keep doing what we call a freedom to choose absence of alternatives. Like, sure, you can keep doing what you're doing. But like, how's that going for you? You know what I mean? Like, how's that going for you in the other areas of your life? So, or like, you know, with some of those more intense, severe behavior or dangerous behaviors that I, that I see with some of my patients with suicidal, self-injurious stuff. Like, you know, it's, it's like, no, that, that needs to stop. <laughs> Otherwise, what are we doing here? We can't fix your life if you, if you are not willing to actually be alive. So it's like, you know, there are certain things where I'm like, no, this is like, you're working with me. This is what we're working on. If we're not working on it, well then. But it sounds like, again, that comes from working with a professional. If you're just like making this up on your own, you're not even going to know where to start. It sounds like, or know the hat, like the things that are good to do. A million percent. Can I make one more comment about that? Cause you just yeah. brought up the most important thing, which is like anybody on the internet, <laughs> including trained professionals, can only give information. They're not providing treatment. Mm -hmm. And that's professionals. Then we have the whole world of um, (laughs) non-professionals, influencers, whatever you want to call them. And I think it's fabulous. Like, that's great. We love the idea of like people sharing their lives and their thoughts and their opinions. Like, I, this is the reason I started a, a professional Instagram is like, I you can't take health advice from somebody who's not a health person just because they think that they're healthy. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean anything. And you don't actually know if what they're doing is healthy. Yes, I will one day run a big study on, on influencer stuff and like 
psychopathology. I just think it's fascinating, but like very dangerous, potentially very dangerous. Always find a professional, always ask the questions of a professional, even if you don't engage in long-term care. I'm like so entrenched in that in the nutrition world, of course, but like I recently, I think I, I think it was another therapist or maybe it was my therapist talked about how in the therapy world that's starting to come up with like health coaches, like, is there anything if somebody is like following somebody who's talking about mental health online that they should, how do you know if it's a professional or not? This is the thorn in my side. Oh, well, you're telling me because I got it from the nutrition world, but I don't know about it from the therapy world. There is so much available around mental health. People are talking about it left and right. People are being so much more forthcoming about what's going on with them, including like influencers, you know, like people who are basically celebrities for like, you know, our, you know, I'm in my thirties, I guess my generation a little bit less, but like definitely the Gen Z, like these are celebrities, you know, like, which is makes sense. Like you don't know (laughs) what's going on in that person's life. That's that's having them engage in certain practices. You don't know who's Mm. telling them to do these things. And I, again, am very mindful of like dogmas in general. I don't believe that there is one right way of doing anything. There's really no should. And so when folks are like journaling, my game changer, like that but like you know what happens is is somebody somebody is who else somebody who's following doesn't matter how old they are doesn't matter their education level doesn't matter says this person is like really has their shit together I want to be like this person and they are like I've been journaling why am I still so anxious and it's like Mm. it's it, it it creates this ideal of like just do this and then this. And no human being is built like that. Not one human being that I've ever met is a just do this person ever. And, and it really frightens me. Like, and this is why I, you know, that's number one, my like problem with influencers. And number two is like, you got to take a better look at like, why you want to be like that person. Mm. Oh, and my one more thing is like, now people are talking about therapy. Like you'll have influencers being like, I'm going to therapy. And this is why I like Eileen Kelly so much, because she has spent so much time explaining what her therapy looks like, explaining Mm -hmm. what she talks about in therapy. It's not just like, you know, I'm a fashion influencer and like, I had therapy this week. Like, what does that even mean? Like, how Mm -hmm. did you find a therapist? Like, it's not like, you know, I picked up lunch today. Like, it's really hard to do therapy. And I'm sure these people are working hard and it would be nice for people to present as more vulnerable if they're going to bring up these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, I think that's good. And yeah, I think it kind of speaks back to too what we were saying about just trying to like in general when you're trying to change habits, like focusing on like you, your journey, what works for you and maybe being inspired. Because even when I tell my people, it's like it's great to be inspired by other people's health journey, but know there's so much behind the scenes, know that they might have worked with somebody. It's like all individual. I do have some clients who say that like habits are really hard in the beginning, right? It's hard to make that first step. It's hard to like put the shoes on and go for the walk. It's not hard to stick with it, but it's hard that first step. Like, why is that? Do you understand why? Like, can you break that down for us? Like nobody wants to do something aversive. Like if it doesn't feel easy or good, Mm -hmm. you're not like anthropologically, like you're not going to, we're not going to run towards that, which is challenging. Like Mm -hmm. that's just not natural. And it's like, oftentimes the push in our brain to like avoid discomfort that makes it so hard for us to like put on our shoes and go for the walk outside for a mile, even if we know we really want to do it, because it's like any excuse to avoid a feeling of discomfort, like your brain will jump on and, and allow you to avoid it. And which then of course creates more negative emotions, which then makes it harder to be effective. And so it's like, this is why a huge part of any sort of change is like, tolerating the distress that come like the discomfort the like oh, I don't like this or like this is annoying or I want to be good at it already like tolerating some of those the emotions that come up maybe anxiety shame guilt whatever that comes up so that those things aren't stopping you there's basically mm-hmm. nothing that can, can get in your own way other than your choice of saying I don't want to do this right now is that where that acceptance comes in of being like this does suck like I don't want to do it but I'm doing it doing it anyway or are you saying something else? Yeah, like, yes. Well, yes, exactly. Actually, distress tolerance and DBT are acceptance-based skills, meaning they're skills that we use when we're not going to change something in the moment. And at the same time, we also know that like 
acting on an urge or like avoiding the thing is going to make it worse. So it's just like, how do we get through a difficult moment without necessarily making it worse and without assuming we're going to make it better, right? Like be, doing something, you know, having the thought of like, I'm only going to do this thing if it's if it's comfortable, we call that mood dependent behavior. Mm. It just doesn't work. There's so many things we have to do in life that are not based in comfortability. Um, yeah, no. And I have that conversation a lot with clients. And normally that's like a breakthrough with like nutrition of like, I don't know if sometimes they think they could still eat brownies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and that's going to magically like transform their weight. But sometimes it's like that mental of like, I ask them like, what do you, you know, what do you hope it would look like? And they say, well, I want to be able to eat whatever I want and have the health changes. And so it's like, what, is there any like tip to kind of get over that? Cause it seems like once they get over that mindset of like, this isn't just going to be like butterflies and flowers all day long. Like there is a little bit of hard work that goes into it. Like how do people get over that hump? A million different ways. <laughs> Like, you know, you have to understand it's really about figuring out what you need to problem solve and what you need to accept. So what mm-hmm. change, what acceptance, you know, like, and and so if that means you think you should be doing, you know, I don't know, like eating vegetables at every meal, like you're not really into vegetables, then like, perhaps you're being too rigid. Mm-hmm. Is there another way to look at this where it could help you like titrate up that habit, right? Like shape mm-hmm. towards that. Okay. So, um, why don't you try having vegetables at one meal? Mm -hmm. See if you can do that. And then we can take you to the next step. And you have to accept that you were going to do this stepwise, like otherwise it ain't going to happen. Right. Like that's ultimately, that's something that we can't change the reality of those things. Mm -hmm. And often we can't make change unless we accept the reality. So you're saying that we have to accept that there's like that little bit of well, the uncomfortableness in the small, the first part, but we can maybe smooth it over by not going like zero to a hundred, but let's like do that small thing first. Yep. Okay, good, good. Yeah. That's what I start with clients. It's like, let's just try to put tennis shoes on today and get outside. Let's just do, yeah, the one vegetable or something at one meal. What do you feel like are one or two things that you wish people knew about behavior change or habit building? It takes a longer than you think it should. Okay. Changing a behavior, creating a new habit takes 14 to 21 days of consistency, which nobody does because nobody is a robot. Like you're not going to do the same exact thing every single, it's really hard to do that. So don't like the worst, the, I, I think I said this before, like the the biggest mistake we make when we're trying to do something different is that we stop doing it too soon. Mm. Let go of, or be mindful of the expectations or the shoulds that you think will happen as opposed to being present and mindful with what actually is happening. So you can allow yourself to continue without presuming that you're failing if things are not happening the way they should. That's like my biggest thing is like, just don't like, don't stop too early. Like I always say, can we give it a month to people at least like, let's give it at least a month. And when people join true with me, I'm like, all right, we got to give, we got to give it at least three months. You know, like you can't just like, then like, come into therapy and be like, well, everything's going to change now. And like, if it doesn't change in three weeks and this sucks, like, Mm. you know, three weeks in the world of, in the world of treatment is like nothing. That's literally nothing. Um, so that's number one. Number two is when you can do something, you can do almost anything. And so this is why we start with small steps Mm. because if you're taking small steps, And you're showing yourself that you can do things. Like I said, you're building that belief in self-efficacy or the capacity to achieve the things that you'd like to achieve, then that will permeate to any other area of your life. I love that. We are previous uh, therapists. We had on talked about self-image. I never thought about that, how if you feel good about like kind of one area of your life, it should kind of go all over the place. And I feel like you're kind of like reverberating that again. It's like, if you know you could have done this like one hard thing, you'll have the confidence to do it again. Is that what you're saying? Yes. Confidence is essentially competence. It's like, I can do this, I, I think, right? So it's really just about like, oh, I've done a hard thing. I know what it feels like. Maybe it's not in the same field, but like I might get similar emotions in all of the hard things I do. And I already know how to, like, it almost becomes more automatic. If you don't have to think about it as much because you know that like the thing that you're feeling, you felt it before, like your brain knows you felt it before and you can get through it. Yeah. I love that. I feel like the theme of this whole episode is like, it's still hard, but just work through it is what I'm hearing every time. Um, I did have um, one audience question. I don't think we really worked in and I feel like this could be a whole episode in and of itself, but I'm going to honor it. Is is there really such a thing as a work-life balance? If so, how do we achieve this goal? Have at it. (laughs) Oh boy. (laughs) The answer is yes. And it depends. 
it, the answer is yes. It depends on what your goals are. <laughs> okay. Depends on what you really want. Like everything is a choice. Okay. Right. Like this idea of like work-life balance or like, I can't leave. Like, it's all a choice. Like you're choosing to, and this is kind of a privileged perspective, but like you're choosing to be in the, like the company that you're being, you're choosing to mm. be as, um, you know, achievement oriented or not. And I think it's just about being aware that like not everything could happen at the same time. And so like, what are your priorities and how do you accept Mm -hmm. that when you prioritize certain things, other things might not be as prominent. And that doesn't mean that you can't then shift your priorities at another point. Mm -hmm. I think it's really about flexibility. That's a work-life balance to me. I'm not the person to ask because- I say this to my trainees, like people that I'm training all the time or like students that I'm teaching. I'm like, listen, like do as I say, not as I do. That's also, I know the choice that I'm making about how how often I work. Like it's a, my friends will like often say like my, my sister, my best friend, oh, hello. My sister, who's my best friend will be like, you're not allowed to complain. You made this choice. And I'm like, you're right. Because she's right. Like mm-hmm. I made the choice with full awareness to take on extra clients or X, Y, and Z. And so if I'm really tired or I don't have time to go on a date, like that's a choice that I'm making. And if that's a big problem for me, then I need to change it. Mm-hmm. So work-life balance just looks like what it's really about. What do you want right now? Mm-hmm. And how do you make that happen? With the understanding that that can and will change at any time. There's no, nothing, nothing is so permanent, you know? So I hear you saying that, again, it is a choice. Like we're choosing how to spend our time if we're like have the luxury to not have to like be a single mom, work like three jobs, stuff like that. But to know yeah. that um, we ha- we choose how we spend our time. And so if we're not happy, we also have the ability to change it. And so thinking about like what those priorities are. Is that right? Absolutely. Like I think also thinking about work-life balance asks us to become aware of or mindful of like our ability to ask for what we want or need, to be assertive, to make change interpersonally. I think that that comes both in the professional world and the personal world, you know? Mm-hmm. And, and, and there's so much, so much of what gets in our way of getting what we want or need is our, the emotions that we have around asking for things or setting a, a limit or whatever it might be, or being a person who like wants to build relationships. We have emotions or thoughts or like we don't know how to make these things happen and therefore we don't do them and so it's also like okay well actually what can you do Mm. without having to say okay this or this like what what can you do like is there actual other intervention that you can do before you say okay I'm going to I don't know like stop answering emails at 5 p.m regard like I I don't know I'm not a corporate person so it's really hard for me to say but um yeah I think it's it's like you have to understand where you fall on that spectrum of like how can you ask for what you want or need and like assert yourself and all that jazz gotcha gotcha okay well speaking of your reels I think your reels are great I like watching them and helps me like I love your sleep ones I'm like okay yeah I'm not gonna take a nap today because Maddie said not to um where can people follow you find you contact you all those good things so as I said, I now have this professional Instagram, uh-huh. which you are more than go along with, and that is Millennial Mindfulness Doc. Doc is in DOC. So that's my Instagram. And if you have questions about treatment or referrals or want to work with me, my time is very, 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 very limited right now. And like, and you're welcome to reach out. You can reach me. My Instagram has my professional email. It's con- it's contact at downtownbehavioralwellness.com. That's the name of my private practice. Um, or you can look at my website, which is also on my Instagram. It's downtownbehavioralwellness.com. And you can contact me through there. Awesome. Thank you so much for joining us today, Maddie. Of course, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for listening to the Millennial Nutritionist Podcast. For daily weight loss tips and nutrition information, you can find us on Instagram at the.millennial.nutritionist and on TikTok at millennial.nutritionist. If you find this information helpful, please subscribe to the podcast and share it with a friend who needs encouragement on their health journey. See you in the next episode.